So, in August 1944, we have the liberation of Paris. The front line on the 26th of August is roughly here. The Germans are in full retreat at this point, which was unexpected. After their defeat in Normandy, Eisenhower thought the Germans would fight on the Zen River. But they didn't. They fell back, and he was completely surprised by this. As a result, Eisenhower faced a bit of a conundrum. Where do you go from here? Obviously, you've got to go east to Germany and Berlin, but how? Well, nine days earlier, on the 17th of August, Monty went to speak to Bradley of the American 12th Army Group. He proposed the idea that, after crossing the Zen River, a joint British, Canadian and American force should advance as one on the northern flank, while Patton's 3rd Army and other southern units should be halted. This joint force would consist of the Canadian 1st and British 2nd Armies from the British 21st Army Group, while the US 1st Army from Bradley's 12th Army Group would be subordinated. This narrow front strategy had the advantage of not only clearing the channel ports, but would also allow a thrust into the Ruhr, the industrial heartland of Germany. And without the Ruhr, the Germans would be economically crippled, hastening their defeat. The basic object of the movement would be to establish a powerful air force in Belgium to secure bridgeheads over the Rhine before the winter began, and to seize the Ruhr quickly. Monty actually describes it as the German Schlieffen Plan of 1914 in reverse, except that it would be executed against a shattered and disorganised enemy. Montgomery states that Bradley was in favour of the plan at the time, although it appears that Bradley may have just been placating him. And thus, a discussion went back and forth over the next few days with Eisenhower. Now, Monty's plan isn't actually a bad plan. It's got a lot going for it. However, there are two critical problems with this plan. One is that it doesn't take into account the bigger political situation, which we'll come back to. But the second is Monty himself. He doesn't just say, here's a plan you might want to consider. It's got loads of advantages. Let me know what you think. No, he doesn't say that. Instead, he says this. Single control and direction of the land operations is vital for success. This is a whole time job for one man, me. The great victory in Northwest France has been won by personal command. Only in this way will future victories be won. If staff control of operations is allowed to creep in, in other words, if your headquarters Eisenhower take over, then quick success becomes endangered. To change the system of command now from my immortal hands, after having won a great victory in my name, would be to prolong the war. Obviously I'm adding extra words in there for comedic effect, but actually that is the subtext of the conversation. Monty thinks he's the second coming of Holy Manstein. He thinks he's a military genius and wants all the power and the glory, and wants the British to get all the praise, which they would if Montgomery, the British commander, commands the force that goes into Germany first and wins the war by Christmas. So, regardless of how good the plan may actually be, and all the advantages it may actually have, Monty's attitude undermines it in Eisenhower's eyes, as well as ours, because it's obvious what he's trying to do. He's not proposing this purely for its military potential, he's proposing it to further his own personal ambition and ego. And that just rubs people up the wrong way. It also doesn't consider the political situation. Yes, there was an American army in this joint allied force, but even if we put an American commander in charge instead of Monty, it just doesn't look good for the USA. Two entire US armies, the 3rd and 7th, would be sat behind the Meuse River as the others got all the glory. And that's not including Simpson's 9th Army, which appeared later. Eisenhower would have a tough time explaining why the USA raised so many divisions to fight in Europe if most of them were sat doing nothing while the British and Canadians won the war for them. If the British and Canadians had been in the South, and the Americans in the North, 
and the British and Canadians just sat there like a sack of potatoes as the Americans raced off ahead of them to win the war, how do you think the British and Canadians would react? Clearly, they would react poorly, although one author actually states that Eisenhower might have been persuaded if this had been the case, concluding that he only rejected it because Monty would have been in command. Also, in order to boost Monty's 21st Army Group, 12 US divisions would have to be taken from Bradley's 12th Army Group, leaving Bradley with just one army. As Eisenhower pointed out to Monty at the time, this alone wouldn't be acceptable to public opinion back home. So, leaving aside the military considerations and just focusing on the politics here, it makes no sense for Eisenhower to accept this plan. Of course, Monty objected to the political side of it as well. I asked him why public opinion should make us want to take military decisions which were definitely unsound. Possibly I went a bit far in urging on him my own plan and did not give sufficient weight to the heavy political burden he bore. Anyhow, he listened quietly. Ike is now one of my dearest friends, and I never cease to marvel at his patience and forbearance with me on that occasion. But my arguments were to no avail. Well, at least Monty admits he was a bit of a Charles Dickens. What Montgomery doesn't state, though, is that Eisenhower also rejected another idea that Monty proposed at the time, which was that Bradley should command the force going into northern Germany. Too many people at Schaefe felt that they had been misled by Montgomery when he had impressed them with his pre-invasion explanation of how tidily the Normandy campaign would be wrapped up. They were not prepared to be bamboozled by him again, nor did they believe he was serious when he suggested that he was willing to serve under Bradley, if necessary, in the ambitious operation he proposed. The British Chiefs of Staff would never have permitted it. So, he didn't reject it for tactical considerations, but rather for political reasons. That's worth bearing in mind. But Eisenhower also rejected yet another proposal for a narrow front strategy. This one suggested that Patton's Third Army would conduct a narrow front thrust in the south. And if you look at the map, Patton is somewhat close to the German border. He could race off there, get across the Rhine and strike into Germany, just as much as Monty could. There are more obvious flaws with the Patton thrust idea though, compared to Monty's, since there would be no thrust into the Ruhr. Instead of an economic ruin, it was just hoped that if Patton just got across the Rhine, that alone would cause a German collapse, which is clearly absurd. Thus, if there was ever going to be a narrow front attack, then Monty's was the most sensible of the proposals. But instead of any of these narrow front ideas, in the end, Eisenhower chose a broad front strategy, which would see all the Allied armies advancing together into Germany. None of Eisenhower's executives liked the compromise, but their complaints were not so loud at the time as they became in later months and years, when each felt that he had been deprived of victory in consequence of that decision. Patton called it the most momentous error of the war. But there were many advantages to it. German armies were basically non-existent at this point, with Monty himself saying that there were two weak panzer and nine infantry divisions northwest of the Ardennes, and that south of the Ardennes they faced what was essentially two panzer grenadier divisions and four more weak infantry divisions. In short, nothing. The Germans had been smashed and were in full retreat. The war could easily have been ended in September 1944. The bulk of the German forces in the West had been thrown into the Normandy battle and kept there by the madman's no withdrawal orders until they collapsed and a large part were trapped. The fragments were incapable of further resistance. There was no organized resistance to stop them driving on into the heart of Germany. As both Kreveld and Basil Lindelhart point out, the idea for the Broad Front strategy had actually been the original plan that was created before the invasion of Normandy had begun. It would have been the perfect plan to stretch and then crack a German force that was still in the field, and this is usually the argument presented in favour of the plan. However, 
the Germans weren't in the field anymore, and that changes our assessment. Eisenhower's broad front plan was far less suited to the actual situation where the enemy had already collapsed, and the issue depended on exploiting their collapse so deeply and rapidly that they would have no chance to rally. In these circumstances, Montgomery's argument for a single and concentrated thrust was far better in principle. I think this is interesting because it's often stated that the broad front strategy was done to stretch the enemy thin. Which it was. However, the enemy was no longer there to be stretched. They were retreating in disarray. So in actuality, this advantage that the broad front had, the one thing most historians state is the reason it was implemented, is in fact mitigated by the disintegration of the German units. Therefore, there wasn't really much of an operational advantage to the broad front strategy at this time. It also appears that Montgomery had always been against the idea of a broad front strategy, even before Normandy. He believed it was too slow. He wanted the war to end quickly, especially now that the Germans were offering little resistance. Again, similar to what I mentioned in the previous Battle of the Bulls video, this is in contrast to the generally accepted view that Monty was cautious and slow. Perhaps elsewhere, but here he was advocating for an ambitious plan to end the war as quickly as possible. And it was Eisenhower and the other American generals who were being cautious and told him, no, the slower broad front strategy was better. To give an example, during the middle of his explanation for Monty's overly ambitious plan, one of the historians, Gelb, says that Monty wanted to preserve casualties by implementing this plan. The implication being, if you read the rest of the book up to this point, is that Monty was cautious and tidy, not daring or as good as General Patton or so on. But this is actually the opposite of the evidence. Yes, he was cautious and tidy elsewhere, but not in late 1944. Monty's cautious reputation, though, persists and clouds the judgment of historians like Gelb in the face of contrary evidence. Now, not only was the main tactical advantage of the broad front strategy undermined by the fact that the Germans had collapsed, but there was also a major downside with the broad front strategy. To implement it, all the Allied armies would need additional fuel and ammunition. Unlike Monty's plan, where only three armies would need additional supplies in order to conduct an advance, at least five armies would need supplying at a higher rate under the broad front strategy. So, as a consequence of Eisenhower's decision, things started to go wrong. The Allies had plenty of supplies, but the problem was transporting those supplies to the front. American divisions had driven into Brittany, but had failed to capture the ports there, so supplies were coming from the port of Cherbourg and the one Mulberry Harbour on Gold Beach that had survived to this point. The further away their armies were from these ports, the further their road and rail transport system would have to go, and the more those services were stretched. Fewer deliveries would reach the frontline troops the closer they got to Germany. Worse, the road and rail network in France had been bombed from the air and sabotaged by the French resistance to the point that the rail network was in ruins and the road system wasn't much better off. Worse, there weren't enough trucks, and those that they did have were breaking down over the long distances thanks to their constant use, while frontline combat units were stripped of their trucks in order to use them to bring up supplies. Every vehicle ran at least 20 hours a day. Such was the strain that one third of the fuel flowing to Patton's Third Army was consumed before it arrived. And these problems were compounded by the discovery that 1,400 or 1,500 lorries in the British Second Army, the sources vary, had faulty pistons and were thus unusable. So as a result of all these factors and more, the armies suffered huge shortages and the men became desperate. Third Army in particular was notorious for the unorthodox means it employed in order to obtain what it needed. Roving, foraging parties impersonated members of other units, trains and convoys were diverted or hijacked, transportation companies were robbed of the fuel they needed for the return journey, and spotter planes were sent hundreds of miles to the rear in order to discover fuel shipments. 
A further problem arose over the transport of petrol. The Allied armies took no fewer than 22 million jerry cans to France in June, yet by August about half of these had disappeared, either sold to French farmers or stolen. Basil Lindell Hart says that the number of jerry cans actually dropped to just 2.5 million by the end of the autumn. It got so bad that the supply units were fatigued to the point that accidents occurred more frequently, and there was even sabotage of their own vehicles. Corruption occurred in the rear areas, with men selling truckloads of supplies on the black market. So as a result of the logistics crisis, Patton's army came to a halt on the 2nd of September because he ran out of fuel, which is not that long after the advance started. Instead of the required 400,000 gallons of petrol he needed, he got just 32,000 gallons. Hodge's first army also ran out of steam a few days later, and it looked like the broad front strategy was beginning to fail. Just as complete victory appeared within easy reach, the Allies' onrush petered out. During the next two weeks, up to September 17th, they made very little further progress. All along the front, the cry was for more gasoline and more ammunition. Every one of our spearheads could have gone further and faster than they actually did. I believed then, and believe now, that on Patton's front, the city of Metz could have been captured. Nevertheless, we had to supply each force for its basic missions, and for basic missions only. Just to point out, sometimes it's been argued that Monty's market garden plan took fuel from Patton and the American generals. But that wasn't true. Patton had already come to a halt two weeks before market garden happened, and it had nothing to do with market garden. And as I said earlier, Eisenhower had expected the Germans to fight on the Zen River. But they didn't. They fell back, and he was taken completely by surprise by this development, along with everyone else. It was this factor that led to the chaos of the supply situation. By the 3rd of September, the line looked like this. They had reached the Meuse and taken some of the ports on the coast, but by not prioritising the Northern Front, most of the supplies were still coming in from the Normandy beaches. Dieppe was captured on the 1st of September 1944, but Le Havre would only be captured on the 12th. Even so, they were both small ports, so there was little relief coming in from their capture. Thus, the burden was placed on the road transports coming from Normandy. The guy in charge of the American supply system, known as Comms, Lines of Communication Zone, was Lieutenant General John Lee. Strangely, he wasn't actually subordinate to Eisenhower, but to Washington, which made him basically untouchable. Lee was a stubborn man who didn't alter the supply schedule to meet local needs, so no extra supplies of fuel were allocated to the armies during this advance because the original plan didn't call for it. In a nutshell, there was no flexibility in his approach, and he had powerful friends in Washington that prevented him from being sacked. This is why foraging parties roamed around to get what they needed. They were battling against the stubborn supply bureaucracy created by Lee. The fact that combat units were reduced to such expedience should have been cause for shame and some drastic action, but nothing was done. Comms people were also accused with considerable factual basis of being more interested in the Paris nightlife than in supporting the troops in the field. Comms staff soon became involved in the thriving black market, where filtering off PX stores or comforts intended for the frontline troops were a way of obtaining the good things of life, girls, fine food, and liquor. In contrast, the British and Canadians used a different supply chain, the Rear Maintenance Service Area, which was subordinated directly to Montgomery. They also had fewer divisions to maintain, especially since the Americans had more divisions on the continent than they originally planned. The only thing they needed was the priority of transport, which they didn't get thanks to Eisenhower's broad front strategy. If they had got that, Montgomery's 21st Army Group could have gone along the coast to capture the ports, which would have shortened the distance the supply trucks would have had to go. 
Of course, the madman in Berlin foresaw this, which is why he placed garrisons along the coast as a way to slow the Allies down. Wow, a super madman move. Like, what an idiot, right? One such garrison was at Bologna, where General Ferdinand Heim, a disgraced veteran of the Stalingrad campaign, took up his first and only position he held after being arrested when commanding the 48th Panzer Corps during Operation Uranus. Heim thought this position at Bologna was a bad idea, but in the madman's eyes, he didn't care because nothing of value would be lost if Heim or any of his troops were destroyed. That said, the ports in Brittany were also held by German garrisons who were better organised and entrenched, and they put up firm resistance, preventing the Allies from taking them in good time. The need to capture more ports, and especially a big one, was why the front was looking like this on the 3rd of September. On the very next day, the 4th, the British captured Antwerp, a port that was desperately needed. In theory, this could have solved most of their logistical issues. So, knowing that Antwerp had been captured, on the 7th of September, Eisenhower cancelled Operation Chastity, the seizure of the ports of Brittany. A decision that Colonel Harold Mack described in 1981 as the critical error of World War II. Which is interesting, considering the Patton quote from earlier saying that the Broad Front strategy was the most momentous error of the war. Of the Brittany ports, only Brest was ever captured. Brest fell on the 19th of September after a long campaign and was so severely damaged that it was never brought into operation. German garrisons in the other Brittany ports were bottled up and surrendered only at the end of the war. Lieutenant General Omar Bradley's campaign for Brest was criticised for wasting 10,000 American lives for no purpose. In September, Cherbourg, the Normandy beaches and the additional ports that had been captured allowed a combined 26,800 tonnes to be delivered to the continent. Had just one port in Brittany been taken, that would have provided an additional capacity of 10,000 tonnes, which was enough to meet the shortfall of the US 1st and 3rd Armies. But it wasn't to be. And the reason why this has been seen as a critical error on the part of Eisenhower was because it was a premature decision. The port of Antwerp wasn't operational yet. The Scheldt region was still occupied by the Germans, and this region needed to be cleared first in order for ships to sail into the port. Well, even 10 days later, on the 14th of September, the Scheldt still wasn't clear, and the other nearby ports weren't either, although Le Havre had fallen by now. Antwerp lies at the root of the dilemma facing the Allied commanders, and the question of why it was not open to shipping immediately after the port itself was taken remains one of the ongoing arguments surrounding the post-Normandy campaign. It has since been argued that, at this point, Montgomery should have concentrated everything he had on the Scheldt. The fact that he didn't do this is proof, in some people's eyes, that he made a serious mistake. Now, it was a mistake to not take the Scheldt. However, it wasn't as if he didn't try. German forces to his east were sizable, meaning that the British Second Army had to be deployed facing that way. This left the Canadians to clear the Scheldt on their own, which they couldn't do until they had first cleared other ports to the west. In other words, the Broad Front strategy had stretched the British too thin to complete their objectives. One thing to bear in mind that's not mentioned in the books for this time period is that Bradley's 12th Army Group was stretched thin. As we learned during the Battle of the Bulge video I did recently, Hodge's 1st Army was left with only a few divisions in which to hold a supposedly quiet front of the line. Now, this obviously happened a couple of months later, but the same principle applied earlier. Monty couldn't just abandon his eastern flank and send his units north. The American armies were stretched thin as it was, and so was he. The broad front strategy meant that the Allies as a whole were stretched thin. Maybe not as thin as the Germans, but thin nonetheless. And they couldn't concentrate on specific areas of the front in sufficient numbers because of this. 
In addition, Montgomery, along with Eisenhower, mistakenly believed that the Canadians were capable of clearing the Scheldt on their own, which it turns out they weren't. It was a tougher nut to crack than they thought. And having committed to the broad front strategy, Eisenhower was also not wanting to prioritise the North and wanted to get across the Rhine as quickly as possible, which is why the ports weren't captured and made operational, why the logistics fell apart, and why the advance ground to a halt. Part of the reason Market Garden occurred was because there were three airborne divisions sat in reserve that needed to be utilised. But it's also because getting across the Rhine at Arnhem meant that they could race to the Isselmere. The theory was that this could encircle the German forces along the coast, including the Scheldt, which would weaken them and hasten their collapse. Thus, this would free up the waters and allow the port of Antwerp to actually function. Of course, Market Garden failed, which not only meant that Monty's narrow front idea was also shelled for good, but it also meant that the Canadians had to clear the Scheldt on their own in order for Eisenhower to revive his broad front strategy. Without the port of Antwerp, which could handle up to 40,000 tonnes per day of supplies, the broad front strategy was dead in the water. Interestingly, it's safe to say that nobody on the Allied side really cared about opening the Scheldt and getting the supplies through until the 27th of September 1944, which was well after Market Garden had started. But even then, it wasn't realised by Monzi or Ike that the Canadians weren't in a position to do the job. The German 15th Army held the area and was pretty powerful for a German army at this time of the war. First Canadian Army was a decent army too, but it only consisted of six divisions divided into two corps, and this small force was spread out and engaged over a wide area. It simply couldn't concentrate on the Scheldt, and even if it had, it would have struggled to do what was needed. General Heim did surrender at Bologna on the 23rd of September, but the force at Dunkirk held on until the end of the year. It wasn't until the 1st of October that most of the Canadian force, except that at Dunkirk, would concentrate on the Scheldt. Due to General Creera being ill, Lieutenant General Simmons stepped up to command the Canadian Army. He was a decent general who had invented the kangaroo armoured personnel carrier, but he faced a formidable opponent. General von Zangen, commander of the German 15th Army, had placed the 64th Infantry Division at Breskens. This was actually a 14,000 man strong force, almost a full German division, which was a rarity at this point. Zangen told Ebeding that each and every day mattered in denying the Allies the use of Antwerp, and he was right. The Germans had flooded the area, and the 64th Infantry Division were veterans of the Eastern Front. They had 23 88mm guns at their disposal and gave it their all. They resisted frontal assaults, amphibious assaults on their flanks, and even continued to resist after their pocket was overrun. It wasn't until the 2nd of November that the 64th Infantry Division was destroyed. This was a huge delay, and even then, this only meant that the Breskens area had fallen not the islands north of there. The island of Valkyren was attacked by amphibious assault on the 1st of November 1944. It was only on the 6th of November that General Wilhelm Daza surrendered and Valkyren Island fell into Allied hands on the 9th. The cost was high. For the entire series of operations in the area, our own casualties, almost entirely Canadian and British, numbered 27,633. This compared to less than 25,000 in the capture of Sicily, where we defeated a garrison of 350,000. Then it took until the 26th or 28th of November to clear the mines, the sources vary, and for the first convoy of 20 ships to enter the harbour at Antwerp. But supplies didn't just teleport to the front, it took time for the logistics chain to adapt. And by the time they started to do so, and gradually get the supplies to where they were needed, they were in the middle of winter, which reduced the capacity of the ports anyway. In September, Cherbourg's capacity was 10,500 tonnes, but this shrank to 8,300 tonnes in December. The Normandy beaches were closed entirely, losing 3,300 tonnes, 
and even with all the ports they had captured, and Antwerp, they were only receiving about 32,400 tonnes, which, while better than the 26,800 tonnes in September, was still not enough. Had the Allies received an additional 10,000 to 30,000 tonnes of supplies a day from the Brittany ports during this critical period, the predictions of Berlin by Christmas might just have come true. But they didn't get those supplies, and were facing the German West Wall, or Siegfried Line, plus a German force that had had time to recover and be reinforced. The delays through September to November had not only strengthened the Germans, but had also weakened the Allies. Apart from their logistics worries, as stated earlier, Eisenhower's broad front strategy had also caused the Allied divisions to spread out thin across a 500 to 600 mile front. This meant that they didn't really have the strength to breach the Siegfried Line, at least not in all places or in any real depth. The result was several attritional battles, the Hürtgen Forest perhaps being the most famous, but others occurred as well, and the Allied armies were sat on or around the Siegfried Line until March 1945. Allied forces suffered through the winter of 1944-45 at the end of an inadequate and inefficient supply network. The push across the Rhine was probably more the result of the general collapse of a Germany under attack from the east than a powerful, overwhelming American and British force. In the meantime, the Germans launched their own offensive in the Ardennes on the 16th of December 1944, and I don't think it's a coincidence that they aimed to take Antwerp. If they had taken Antwerp, the Western Allies could have been delayed by their logistics issues for many more months, and it is perhaps the broad front strategy that gave the Germans the opportunity to both recover from the defeat in France, but also launch the Ardennes Offensive. The price that the Allied armies paid for the missed opportunity in early September was very heavy. Out of three quarters of a million casualties which they suffered in liberating Western Europe, half a million were after their September check. The cost to the world was much worse. Millions of men and women died by military action and in the um, naughty camps of the Germans with the extension of the war. Considering all this, though, I don't agree with some of the historians who say that they should have taken the Brittany ports. While additional port capacity would have helped, it was the lack of transport that was the major issue during this time. They didn't need ports miles behind the lines, they needed ones closer to the front. That was the problem. So Brittany is more or less irrelevant. What mattered was getting Antwerp operational sooner. This is also why I disagree with the historians advocating for additional reinforcements to be landed on the continent as a way to breach the Siegfried Line at specific points. Yes, if we ignore the logistics issues entirely, then the British 6th Airborne plus four more infantry and two armoured divisions, which were all sat in Britain, could have been sent over. But again, the logistics issues prevent this. The irony is that Colley, the author of the book The Folly of Generals, advocates for the units in Britain and those in Brittany to be shipped to the front, and then proceeds to downplay the logistics issues, stating that, well, these divisions could have been moved because there were enough trucks to actually do that. Like, yes, maybe they could have been moved, but then what? You have to supply them, and without Antwerp, you don't get those supplies. He says that Ridgeway got his airborne divisions to the bulge via truck, but fails to realise that Antwerp had been made operational in late November, so additional units could be supplied at the front by that point. That's why Ridgeway got his airborne divisions. But back in September, it wasn't possible to just bring up a load of additional divisions and expect them to be supplied. After downplaying the logistics issues, he then concludes, well, it was all Monty's fault. The Allies were about to launch Market Garden, and this was Montgomery's show. And to upstage Montgomery with a breakthrough in the Eiffel would have been unthinkable. The Anglo-American alliance was fragile enough, with the British being overshadowed by American might at all levels. The Brits needed a victory led by one of their own. 
No, they needed to outflank the German 15th Army so as to make it easier for the Canadians to take the Scheldt. They weren't going to the east or the Ruhr, they were going north to the Isselmere. By cutting off and weakening the German 15th Army, the Scheldt could be cleared quicker, and this would make the port of Antwerp operational, allowing additional supplies to reach all the units and allowing the broad front advance to continue. This is what a lot of people seem to miss about Operation Market Garden. The objective was to clear the Scheldt by an outflanking manoeuvre. With Antwerp operational, the supplies needed for the broad front strategy could have come through. That's why the failure of Market Garden not only ended the idea of Monty's narrow front strategy, but it also doomed Eisenhower's broad front strategy as well. The failure at Nijmegen results in the Canadians and British having to mount frontal assaults across water against heavy and stubborn German opposition at the Scheldt. It results in massive delays, and that's why you see the broad front strategy fail. Yes, Market Garden was Monty's show, but Eisenhower approved it because he needed to clear the Scheldt. A direct assault on the Scheldt would only have succeeded by late November, as it did in the end. Market Garden promised to hasten the collapse of the German 15th Army. That's why it's in both the British and Canadians and the Americans' best interest to have Market Garden succeed. Yet Colley, just like many other authors, such as Gelb, proceeds to explain how Monty was just advocating for a thrust on the Ruhr, and how Eisenhower just gave in to him, simply to keep the peace between the British and the American generals. But if this was the case, why were the British aiming northwards to the Isselmere, not east to the Ruhr? And the answer, of course, is because the objective was to outflank the German 15th Army, not get to the Ruhr. Now, while Eisenhower doesn't state directly that the objective of Market Garden was to clear the Scheldt, he does give loads of hints that this is what he was focused on. I instructed him, Monty, that what I did want in the north was Antwerp working, and I also wanted a line covering that port. After saying that Market Garden's objective was to outflank the Siegfried line and get across the Rhine, he then says... If these things could be done, we would engage in no additional major advances in the north until we had built up our logistics in the rear. So, there was no planned thrust to the Ruhr or Berlin, even though he says that this was the objective elsewhere. After the completion of the bridgehead operation, Markagon, he, Montgomery, was to turn instantly and with his whole force to the capture of Valkyrie Island and the other areas in the Scheldt from which the Germans were defending the approaches to Antwerp. So, why doesn't Eisenhower directly state that the actual objective of Market Garden was to clear the Scheldt? Because Market Garden failed. An entire British airborne division was wiped out and numerous losses were incurred. Being the politically minded man as always, Eisenhower offered the explanation that they were racing for Berlin. Because it's easier to stomach those losses in such a case than if we say the actual reason was to outflank the German 15th Army at the Scheldt. Many historians miss this because they let their hatred of Montgomery cloud their judgement. In reality, Market Garden was a high risk but high reward operation. And had it paid off, and had all those extra supplies come in by, you know, early October, you could have seen both Monty and Patton advancing into Germany in late 1944. But it didn't work. Therefore, by saying the objective was purely about Berlin and the Ruhr, and by hinting that it was Monty's fault, which is great because everyone hates Monty anyway, Eisenhower can justify the losses to both the British and American audiences. So yes, blame Monty all you like for Operation Market Garden. It was Gavin. But don't dismiss Operation Market Garden as Monty's harebrained scheme. No, it was in Eisenhower's and America's best interest to have it succeed, which is why Eisenhower approved the plan in the first place. Anyway, in these circumstances, and considering all the various factors and options, I still think that the broad front strategy was the right choice. I don't think it was well executed, 
The logistics, thanks in part to Lee, were terrible, and the failure to prioritise the capture of the ports was the big issue, and I think that Monty is partly to blame for this, simply because Market Garden was a disaster, meaning that the German 15th Army wasn't cut off from its supply base, and thus the port of Antwerp wasn't usable until late November. However, Eisenhower and his staff were also responsible for not prioritising the North, or just not executing the Broadfront plan correctly. That said, I still think it's the right strategy in the circumstances. It's not the correct strategy, but it is the right strategy. And I'm going to have to explain what I mean by this. Had this been an all-American force, or an all-British force, and if we ignore the logistics issues, then the correct strategy might have been a northern thrust over the Rhine and into the Ruhr. However, this wasn't an all-American force, and there were massive logistical issues. The Western Allies were an international coalition, meaning that politics played a significant part in all decision-making. That's why Eisenhower was the right man for the job, unlike Monty, because Eisenhower was good at keeping the various allies together, as well as satisfying the people at home. We may not like the political factor, we may say that we should stick to tanks, but as Monty himself said, Eisenhower cannot ignore the political situation. He had to bow to the political imperative. This is why it simply doesn't make sense for most of the American divisions to be left behind while Monty, of all people, sped off to the Ruhr. Even if Bradley took over, it still doesn't make sense. I would also say that Monty's attitude was terrible. I haven't gone into a lot of detail regarding his personality in this video because <laughs> There's simply not enough time, but he said so much controversial stuff that we could be here all day just quoting him. Eisenhower and the American generals were not inclined to listen to Monty because of his bad attitude, so it's no wonder they dismissed him. On the flip side though, I do think many historians have let Monty's bad attitude cloud their judgement of his military capabilities. Yes, he had a bad personality, but in terms of tactics and strategy, his ideas weren't as bad as has often been made out. He wasn't as cautious at times as often portrayed, and I think many historians are misjudging his decision-making as a result of that. Market Garden is a great example of that because the objective wasn't to get to the Ruhr for personal ambition. It was actually to get to the coast and therefore make Antwerp operational, a military consideration. Yet, historians are so fixated on hating Monty and what he said that they can't even recognise what the actual operation was really aiming to do, which was save Eisenhower's broad front strategy. So don't look at what Monty said the objective was, look at where the tanks were aiming. They were going north. And, paradoxically, the logistics issues actually supported the broad front idea more than the narrow front idea, which is the opposite of what many of the authors conclude. Had the British raced off to the Ruhr, their transport columns, which were already overstretched, wouldn't have been able to keep up. The supply trucks simply couldn't have gone from Cherbourg to the Ruhr. That's insane. And it wasn't the lack of port capacity, it was the lack of local ports close to the front. That's why they had to take Antwerp and the Scheldt first before they get to the Ruhr. They, that didn't happen until late November, by which point the weather was bad, plus the Germans then launched their own offensive in December. So Antwerp was needed to enable the narrow front, but by the time Antwerp is made operational, you're into the new year anyway, and in the meantime, the broad front is the best way to go, but that, that then fails because they didn't capture Antwerp. So I agree with the authors who say that the broad front strategy led to problems and delays, and I think we can blame Eisenhower, Lee, and Montgomery to some extent for this. Mistakes were definitely made. But I also disagree with the authors who conclude that Eisenhower was wrong, or was a bad general, for picking the broad front strategy. No! I think the broad front strategy was the right decision, because the narrow front strategy wasn't politically or economically viable in the circumstances. Sometimes military matters have to be subordinated to the politics or economics. In other words, don't stick to tanks. Thanks for watching, bye for now.